Great. I'm seeing it's uh, just about 11.05, so uh, I'm going to get started. I'd like to welcome everybody to our very first Corporate Impact Symposium um, this morning, and, and thrilled to have so many of you with us um, from around the city, um, supporters, volunteers, corporate partners, foundation partners. It's exciting to see the interest that there is in this particular topic. I would like to start first. Uh, by welcoming our moderator, Joan Steinberg, who's Managing Director of Morgan Stanley, President of the Morgan Stanley Foundation, Dr. Rasan Harris, CEO of Citizens Committee for NYC, and Melva Miller, who is the CEO of the Association for a Better New York. Uh, our conversation today uh, launched back in March with the release of a report called Value Volunteering that came out from CEC. Org. And in case you haven't seen it, we will be sharing it with you later. Uh, the report really focused on the impact of corporate volunteerism and what increases that impact. As that discussion started, because everybody on the phone is deeply concerned with corporate impact and deeply invested in companies being a part of the fabric of New York City, uh, we also thought about this moment in time. Right. As we are all striving for an equitable reopening of New York City uh, with a pandemic that has affected the entire city, um, but different areas of the city and different people within the city at, in very different measures. We wanted to come here today and say, how should corporate volunteering and corporate impact in the city think about the coming years? using this as a moment for us all to be better at the work we do. I'm gonna just share a couple very quick um, observations from value volunteering before I turn it over to Joan. First, the big finding and what brought us here today, when workplace volunteer programs contribute to social good in tangible ways, they also have a significant business impact. And therefore we wanna start thinking about program design that is anchored in the needs of nonprofits and community stakeholders. Workplace volunteering has grown tremendously over the last year, 10 years for a variety of reasons that we have up there. And then volunteering, uh, important to know that our sector, 40% of nonprofits rely on volunteers and that 90% of nonprofits are indicating that the demand for their service is rising and nearly 60% say they cannot meet that demand. Um, and the pandemic has exacerbated that issue as the pool of volunteers, whether it's from companies or individuals, um, has decreased. Um, when we talk about those benefits of workplace volunteering, just as a reminder for the folks on the phone, we're looking at employee engagement, reputation for the company, trust and team building. And we know that employees who volunteer are more committed and they have a more positive perception of their employer and their colleagues. So the big message of this report is all of this gets better if we're really genuinely meeting community need. So with that, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and I'm gonna turn it over to Joan Steinberg to start the conversation. If you have questions, please feel free to put them in the Q&A. We're leaving 25 minutes at the end to take questions. Thanks, Gary. Thanks. So if you're like me and you normally don't read these reports and you only read the executive summary, um, I wanna start, <laughs> let's be honest. Um, I kind of wanna start by asking um, our other panelists kind of what are the, standout things when you read this, what really spoke to you? Melba, why don't I just start with you and then uh, we'll move on to Rasan. Sure. I thought we were going to start with Rasan because he had, he was so excited about answering this question. I'm sorry. And he did the cooler like <laughs> wave when we started. I did like the stupid wave, but yeah, well, I say, I'm discriminating against you, Rasan, because you were cooler. <laughs> no, I said to myself, I was going to tease him. <laughs> <laughs> So first, I'd just like to thank, <laughs> um, you know, Gary for inviting us to do this. This was a very important conversation and including me in the club. I knew I know you and Rasan have been talking for some while about how to sort of magnify the importance of um, volunteering in a real and tangible way. And I'm so happy that you've invited the Association for a Better New York to join this conversation and to join this discussion here today. 
So, you know, when we talk about sort of, um, and, and you know, what I liked what the report did, it, it should have shined the spotlight on the fact that we know that employee volunteering programs allow employees to feel better about what they do and the companies that they work for, right? So it's like, how do we do this in a real way in a time um, when we are facing so many challenges in our city um, you know, it's really good to have sort of the facts and, and, and sort of the, the, the science behind it and having this sort of report show that. Um, but it's also about helping out a charitable cause that is important to employees, right? So it's about feeling good about the moment in time you're in. It's about feeling good about the company that you work for. And it's about feeling good about doing something that's important that sticks to your core values. And now more than ever, people are looking for ways to give back, right? You know, just during the last year, what I've seen um, in the height of COVID-19, in the height of social uh, and racial unrest across the country, unrest across the country, you know, I've seen New Yorkers come out in amazing ways. I've seen organizations sort of partner with one another in amazing ways. And this goes to what this report talks about, right? So, you know, the three things more importantly, um, you know, that I thought was really striking in this report was one, um, in talking about sort of opportunity for employee recruitment, right? We all know that getting uh, diverse uh, talent in the pipeline in your corporation is really important. Um, but now we know today's top young talent considers corporate volunteer programs significant um, in when they're prioritizing when they want to evaluate when they're evaluating options for work, right? And more importantly, I think it's a great way to also see talent in neighborhoods and communities that companies wouldn't normally be exposed to while they are out doing this great work when there's such need, right? We have all heard the statistics about young professionals say that they would prefer to work for a company that provides opportunities to serve the communities with their skills and will consider a lesser role or a lower wage, depending, right, if they can contribute more to society. However, now we see that companies are now seeing also the reverse, the values in these communities, because there's so much talent. And I know we'll talk a little bit about this later, but it's also about, right, it's not about a company going into a, into a community to do this work. It's about partnering with stakeholders in that community to design the program. And that creates that opportunity to recruit and see the talent in that program. Really quickly, the second thing I liked really about this report is it talked about the importance of leading to public reputation. Again, you know, as we are looking for ways uh, to show up better, uh, as 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 corporate New Yorkers, right? The reputation and the 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 value of our company to the world is really important, right? A good rep uh, reputation is increasingly linked to bottom line and benefits for that company. So corporate citizens are sort of seeing the value in. Uh, participating in these volunteer uh, opportunities because of what it does to their uh, reputation. And lastly, stronger communities, right? This report really points to the opportunity to build stronger communities, right? Companies are essential to creating meaningful change because they have resources that governments and nonprofits don't sometimes, right? And we see this with our ABNY membership stepping up. You know, these are New Yorkers that have dedicated their lives to the civic good, you know, our membership. So, you know, building stronger communities through this value add through volunteering is extremely important and companies play a critical role in building that communities. So, you know, there's tons of things that this report really solid that this report solidifies for me. But those were the three uh, sort of standout points uh, that I wanted to talk about today. And I'm sorry if I took too long. Not at all. Thank you. And that's perfect. Actually, Rasan, I, I, I made fun of your wave, but I do want to hear what you have to say. <laughs> um, <laughs> if you can add uh, to what Melba started, what were the things that really resonated for you? Uh, so first and foremost, I want to say that there are literally centuries worth of commitment to New York City that are represented in these institutions that are on this call. So it is humbling to be here. Um, the partnership is, and the togetherness, and together is part of our mission. Citizens Committee brings people together that identify problems in their communities to solve them, particularly being intentional about those that are most vulnerable. That's how New York City is going to be forever. That's how New York City is going to win. Uh, so the report specifically made me happy for two reasons. Um, one, it was because meeting community need equaled 
social impact. And as organizations are looking to have a social impact, how you define success really matters. We all want to win. And in this report, it links community need in that success. So that means partnership, that means listening, that means creating something together that can be valuable. And then the second piece, uh, intentional design, which is related to the first piece, leads to success. And intentional design has a lot to do with how we define value. Um, we talk about value and something valuable being worth, but you can also talk about value being beliefs. And so in your design, if you recognize what you believe and then how what you believe can be utilized to create something that is worthwhile and valuable and going to Melva's great points about winning and success and creating value in a company has to do with keeping talent, keeping folks aligned, keeping folks happy, particularly in this world where things are a little bit upside down, being able to retain talent and, and, and put them on meaningful projects that help them live their values and then create something valuable is a double win. So I'm really excited that we are being intentional in our design that can help companies win. We're intentional about centering community within these responses because communities win. And then when both are winning, then New York City wins. Awesome. And actually saying New York City, I'm gonna to go to you, Gary, for just a second. This is obviously an abstract written in, you know, sort of the ethereal world, but we're working in a city that is trying to come back. Um, one of the earliest places for COVID to hit in the United States, we got hit hard early. And so we are taking a little longer. Can you just talk from your perspective and you talk to hundreds of charities, yeah. how do you see what was kind of in this report and the efforts to reopen the city? Where would you sort of start having looked at both sides of this? Yeah, I think there was a huge opportunity um, in all the struggles we had over the last year, because in times of crisis and disaster, that is a, the one time that I realized we totally go to a space of saying, what do people need, right? And companies and our volunteers really adopted a, where do you need me? So I, I think there's a moment to build on, to not let go of. And as we're reopening, um, the thing I, I do want to let folks know is that, and I think we're all aware of this struggle between being optimistic and then knowing the lines at the food pantries have not decreased, yeah. right? So I'm optimistic because I'm going to ride my bike to work. Um, I'm optimistic because <laughs> I don't have to wear a mask everywhere, but I am riding by the lines, right? So I think in this moment, um, I would, and this is hard post-disaster, for everybody, it's to say, don't forget this is still happening, right? And take the energy you brought to the last year of saying, where do you need me? And keep that as institutions and as individuals. And I wanna take pick up from there because I think one of the things that we're all struggling with on the corporate side is, um, uh, we used to do a lot of things that were in-person volunteer based. And I, I do wanna talk about like days of service, months of service, but a lot of us have sort of hybrid gone into a lot of virtual opportunities. Yeah. We don't have full employees back in our offices. We may not have full employees back in our offices, even in the go forward. So I kind of want to ask the panel around how, how do we do this in this moment, particularly Melva, to your point that a lot of the communities that need the service may be physically very distant from where if people are in the office, they are, but also distant from where they might live. And so how are you thinking about that? How are your partners thinking about that? And where does virtual get to live maybe going forward? Maybe I'm just gonna start with you because you started with some of the faraway communities. I'm gonna start there, but I wanna hear from everyone. How are you trying to manage? I will say as a corporation, we're struggling with how far we try to push these things because we're not sure who's gonna be where at any time. Yeah. So, I mean, I'd love to jump right in on that. Um, you know, it's really about providing the opportunity for employees, I think, because again, um, what I've found over the last year is that people are dying for ways to give back and contribute if they can, right? And I think it's about create, being creative, it's, a, it's about being innovative, and it's about giving them the opportunity to do in-person or virtual or write a check, right? We, all, we, need, we, we need them all. Um, so, you know, whether, and I know we're going to talk a little bit about this later, but whether it is sort of more skill-based and providing opportunities for your employees to donate their skills, for certain efforts, case in point, 
this pandemic came in the middle of uh, New York trying to count uh, New Yorkers for the decennial census. And a lot of the uh, opportunities that we had planned for outreach were in-person events. We had to quickly pivot and change our strategy to virtual events. And we had tons of companies, um, corporations who volunteered to step up and help New Yorkers be counted. So we had to figure out how we could match uh, uh, corporations and organizations with community-based efforts, um, and particularly in a virtual space. So whether it was helping them with uh, online digital campaigns, right, using sort of skill sets in their organizations to donate time and services for these community-based organizations to get New Yorkers counted. Um, you know, again, making sure that we provide all types of opportunities, because we've also seen companies uh, promote volunteer days, whether it was at food pantries where we did um, combination census outreach, PPE distribution and food distribution. And employees stepped up and said, either I live in this community and I want to uh, volunteer and, 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 um, and provide a day of service here, or they went to other communities because they've never been there and have been hearing so much about these very distinct communities that have been hit so hard by COVID that they wanted to do something. So I think, you know, as we think about reopening and reopening safely uh, and understanding the assets that we have at our disposal, it's about multiple options. It's about being creative and innovative and giving uh, citizens of this city the opportunity to go local or go far, right? To Staten Island, uh, if we <laughs> must, to, uh, <laughs> to uh, you know, provide some services in this much uh, uh, needed uh, time. So yeah, I think it's just about being creative and being innovative and being nimble. Rasan, you want to add to that? Oh, for sure. Um, first and foremost, uh, one of these uh, behind me is a Staten Island school. So you just shouted out Staten Island, so thank you very much. <laughs> Citizens Committee serves the five boroughs. We have grantee partners and neighborhoods in all of them. And to your point, uh, Staten Island feels sometimes that they don't get as much uh, attention as others. So it's really figuring out, I'll start with this point that a lot of corporations can hopefully benefit from. Your employees live in communities. And a lot of employee giving programs that allow folks to designate, sometimes that's data that you already have that gives you a peek into what communities people are in and what they care about. So I think some of the, the corporate social responsibility programs can mine that data to figure out where folks are. Um, and then Melva talked a lot about the spectrum of engagement. On one level, it's send the check, that money means a lot and that's helpful and thank you. On the other level of the spectrum, it's being involved in the strategy and the implementation of a project. And then there's all this stuff in between and there's not a right answer, but I think folks need to figure out where on the spectrum they would like to put their time, talent and treasure to be useful. And if you do that analysis, that's uh, extremely uh, important to figure out where to begin. And then specifically for citizens committee, this question is near and dear because my first day was in the office on March 16, 2020. The day New York City shut down was my first day running this organization. Thank you very much. So we had to literally do everything, build culture, create systems, get folks to feel that they're heard, get feedback loops remotely. We also have grantee partners that are in all the communities in New York City. So we did phone banking as we put out a survey asking New Yorkers what they need. That helped inform the first round of grants that we made. We have a bunch of folks that are filling out applications to apply for our micro grants. The social capital being connected to someone that can even reread what they said and see if it's clear and articulate and makes the case for getting funding would be great. So connecting folks that can be mentors just to even read over a narrative mm -hmm. that's being submitted. You know, there are tons of things that you can do that are from afar are uh, potentially hybrid. And then, you know, the, a community garden, uh, you know, garbage being picked up, telling folks to get out there to, to make sure they vote uh, for the primary and for the election. Those are things that folks can get out and do. But I think it needs to be grounded in listening what people in community feel comfortable doing, because there are gonna be difference in culture of where people wanna show up and 
who feels like they need to wear a mask into 2025, and then also figure out where value can be added. Yeah, so I, I want to talk a little bit, Gary, you're like the king of uh, community service month, so we're gonna, I want to pull you in here. <laughs> but that's one of the things when I was reading the report that I reacted to as a corporate was the pressure that nonprofits feel to like come up with BS activities for employees to do that aren't the most meaningful, but they recognize it as a way into the company, a funding source. Yeah. And listen, we all run our days of service and not every project yeah. is as meaningful. So I'm, I'm really interested in that continuum and what your take is on it. You know, I will only say, um, and we talked about this when we were prepping for this, I love these kinds of reports, but they're not, they're not Bibles and they're not, there's, I, don't, I want to take the judgment out of there's good and there's bad because some of those things actually do create a different value. It may be the first time that employees volunteered anywhere. And if it gets them on the, the, the pathway to do more, it had value, even if what they did maybe in that second didn't. So Gary, you help a lot of companies yeah. plan this. You know, how are you starting to think about that continuum where, you know, community days of service, let's be honest, the community's need and the nonprofit's need, it may not be as impactful or upfront in some of those yeah. projects, we're talking volume, than it might be with other things. So talk a little bit about that from your perspective. It's a, it's a great question. And I think, you know, impact is still central to it, right? If we go to a, a place and we didn't feel like our work was necessary, that's a bad first experience, yes. right? So <laughs> if, if, if we're looking for exposure, we want to be exposed to something good. I will say from the nonprofit side, and this is something we we work very hard with it uh, on and are, are very intentional increasingly about speaking to communities is a lot of communities and nonprofits are sort of so convinced that they can't get help that if you say, what do you need? They don't have an answer, yeah. right? So part of our role, and sometimes for us, it's you know being with a school and saying, hey, could you use some gardening outside the school? And, and there really is a, oh, we could have that, <laughs> right? So not every, not every partner is rolling their eyes going, I don't want a big day of service, right? Um, and so I think the intentionality is for the company to say, how are we still connecting meaning to this big one-time event, right? And then for the partner um, to begin to experience what the power of whether it's group volunteering or individuals can mean, right? Because after that group event, the nonprofit and some of those volunteers might say, hey, I want to go back to that school, right? How else can I get involved? And the other thing I would say in this moment in time, and this builds off the report and this concept of virtual, and I think it's a big balance we're going to have to make, um, is, listen, we can get more volunteers to the South Bronx virtually right now yes. than we can get there in person. So, you know, there's this moment where it's like, is the, we don't want the perfect to be the enemy of the good, but at the same time, you know, one of our values and one of the reasons I think all the groups on this call are so powerful is we all believe in showing up, right? And so how are we going to balance the humanity of I went to that school um, with I went to that school virtually? Because both are important and both give us a, a chance to really grow and increase our service. I want to dig in there a little bit because a lot of, not all, but a lot of the virtual stuff that did come out this year was a little bit more skills-based and a little bit more into pro bono because it lent itself to the forum. And I think we've been really focused on that and interested in trying to grow people who are interested in causes into thinking more about giving their skill set. Yeah. Um, but we have found the nonprofit community isn't always ready. Um, for how to use those skills. So Rasan, I want to start with you. How are you thinking about is your, you know, so your community organizations are getting together and coming up with ways they want to solve a problem. How ready are they or how are you working with them to get them ready to work with folks like us, whether that's virtually or in person, but now it seems a lot more like virtually. How, how do you think about that, that part of the, the continuum? So I'm going to say something that might sound blasphemous for my organization <laughs> so I'm just right now. <laughs> Although we give out, we gave out over a million dollars in 2020, I believe our most valuable piece is our social capital that we confer. <laughs> that said, corporations that are ready to have individuals, prime, I mean, not primarily, but particularly hungry, young, ambitious folks that want to try out skills that can have great business success, but also help a nonprofit innovate, that, that is really exciting. 
So I was a Peace Corps volunteer in South America. I was a 22 year old running around. Uh, I realized I was free labor, but I wasn't necessarily a lot of wisdom. And so in these volunteerism spaces, you got to create a dialogue where folks can listen to each other and figure out when folks are ready. But I will tell you from our Zoom meetings that we have for Citizens Committee, we do what we call a neighborhood chat every third Tuesday evening. Folks are in breakout rooms, they're meeting with each other, they're, they're creating relationship and things are happening. It is all the more valuable if we had corporate partners and other stakeholders and politicians that are in those smaller sets of five and 10 people and you can figure out who's ready to like help me write my business plan or someone's like, listen, I just figured out how to use my iPhone. Like I'm not ready, I'm not gonna get on Clubhouse. Uh, and and they, But there's a range, but it really starts from listening first before acting as opposed to making assumptions. But I think there is a hunger, there's an appetite for folks to be connected where folks that can give them access to a larger world of exposure and social capital that's out there. So I, I completely agree. And I was also gonna say for the companies that are on this, for individuals to use their skills and to join something like your, your chats, is probably easy. I think when it comes to more time intensive plans as corporations, we just need to be honest that it's a bigger commitment by the corporation. It's a time suck of our employees. And for the people who are running those programs, you don't just get to hand them off. Somebody has to manage the process and keep the wheels on the track. So I, I wanna talk about the investment that goes in. But before we completely get there, I actually wanna talk about something else you mentioned. And it comes back to this diversity issue and particularly equity in our communities about who's also going and who's serving who. And Melba, we talked about this when we were in our little like prep session. So I just wanted to, we, cause we talked a lot about diversity in our prep session. I wanna just introduce the conversation here and get your take. And it's something you said in that meeting really like hung out in my head for a while, which is the idea that sometimes companies will give certain volunteer programs to maybe like an affinity group um, and who's serving who and how that plays out. And when that's, when that's maybe not the best plan. Um, so I really want to talk about that because I sat there going, oh crap, did we do that? So uh, why don't you talk <laughs> about that? And then let's bring it back to the broader issue, but because that's going to definitely be a part of the city's recovery. So if you can start there and then we can move from there. Absolutely. So, you know, it's all about intention and it's all, all about thinking about the greater good, right? And sometimes it's not done maliciously. Um, it's, you know, it's, it's, just, it's just most, I'm going to say most times, here in New York at least, it's not done maliciously. Um, it's it's just, it's, it's, it comes from a place of sort of being naive, right? And it's about education. Back to what Rasan said, it's about having those conversations and really understanding and, you know, a lot of my career, I've been working in Queens, and we're going to claim it. We are the most diverse county in the world. Um, and we have a lot of conversations about what diversity means in representation and how do one learn and interact from different cultures. And, you know, it's really important not to make assumptions about a need or a culture, but have that conversation first. And I think, you know, um, if you are transparent and you're open and you're, you're uh, okay to have that, you know, sort of a uh, discussion with yourself, then you can have that discussion with others. And from, you know, my position now at Abney, now representing the entire city of New York, you know, I am very fortunate to run an organization with so many committed New Yorkers. I would say there's a large number of our members who've been members since day one. We are celebrating 50 years this year. And these are corporate citizens that are really invested in the city and, you know, have no problems writing the check. Right. I guess from day one, you know, we were founded in the 70s during the fiscal crisis and what, you know, our founding members did to prevent the city from filing bankruptcy was to write a check. Right. They prepaid their property taxes so that the city wouldn't have to sort of be in such a terrible financial crisis. So that part is easy for our members. But, but moving into the next phase where it's, we go beyond writing the check and sort of getting more hands on and implementable in communities is where we are transitioning now. So it's about, yes, it's great to write that check and we love that, but now how can you get your, or your company, your corporation, your employees involved in whether it's the census, whether it is how do we grow the city more equitably, right? How do we get you involved hands on in these communities communities and just don't send that Asian American affinity group, right? Because 
the Italian Americans might want to learn from the African American, you know, community and might want to, you know, try the soul food in Harlem, right? And, and be exposed. And that's what New York <laughs> City is about, right? right? So in thinking about how do we show up, and how do we do it respectfully, right? It's about creating those partnerships. And to your point, Joan, right? It's not just about handing it off. We here at Abney are really committed to being that intermediary, right? Being that one that sort of facilitates the process between the opportunity and that corporation who wants to step up for that opportunity and guide them in a sensitive, respectful way to understand that community. But we have to think outside the box. We can't just say, you know, you know, Asians want to only want to volunteer in Asian communities, right? Because that isn't necessarily true. So being thoughtful, being intentional in how we celebrate our diversity and expose our diversities within these opportunities of volunteering, uh, volunteerism, I think is, 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 is so important. John, I just really want to plus one on it really quickly. Please. The beauty of New York City is our diversity um, and getting behind each community as we've struggled and just seeing who's showing up for you is one of the most beautiful things that you can have. And what we don't want to create is this, I got to be absolutely perfect to know exactly what to say in the moment, shaming people and not even trying. Yeah. If you can yeah. orient people how to show up, you have two ears and one mouth. So do a little bit of listening before you talk and then yeah. folks start to trust you. Then we can start easing into the parts that we don't feel so comfortable. Then that's where the magic happens. And that's what makes us like the shining example on the hill for the rest of the world to see because we're all together and we can make it happen. I think it's a really good point. And I think part of the <clears throat> needs education that the nonprofit sector can provide the corporations is this little piece of cultural competency. And to your point, it's not necessarily like you have to understand everything that ever happened, but but two seconds in the other person's shoes before you speak is super helpful and will make your experience better too. So I think that's a really important point. Um, I want to, I'm realizing I'm looking at our time. If we want to get to yeah. Q&A, I think we kind of have to hustle. I want to yeah. know, I know we've talked about getting more impact into the work that we're doing. Um, what are the changes that organizations are making or need to make in order to be able to make more impact. And I'm, I'm gonna ask that both on like, what do you think corporations need to do better besides being so demanding and making our volunteers go and clean parks? Um, what, are, what are the things there, but what do you think that the organizations, I mean, I can certainly name a few things, but from your opinion, Gary, why don't you go first? Cause, cause uh, you've been talking a while. <laughs> <laughs> and that's very unusual for anybody who knows me. Um, I, I think there are a few things. One, and, and we all talked about this in our prep call, is, is the investment that this is going to take for nonprofits, right? We have, for a long time, we have learned that if you don't put money behind questions of equity and cultural competence, it doesn't happen, yeah. right? As I often say to folks, if it's not in your budget, <laughs> it isn't happening. Right. So um, as companies are coming in, I think, you know, to Rasan's point before, like, listen, right. And say, instead of saying, here's what I want to do, um, you should absolutely have a good sense of that. But you should also say, and what do I need to do to prepare for that? Right. And that's where some of the listening for the nonprofit comes in. What does cultural competency look like? What does you know, picking a different park look like because it's the real need of that community. So um, I think both for nonprofits and companies, a huge investment in cultural competency is a big first step toward us having a genuine impact in the kind of work we're doing. We have a, we have a adorable oh. visitor. Um, <laughs> I love Zoom. I'm just, I'm just going to add to that on the corporate side um, in terms of some of the resources. There's a, you know, what, what are the kind of resources that you might need? I, I'm just going to add that I think the corporate sector's response to inequities in our communities has often been knee jerk. Um, uh, I've been around for 25 years in my company, and there's definitely sort of this, oh my God, it's terrible. We should do something. And it kind of mimics disaster response. And there's nothing wrong with, with trying to help organizations in the, in the moment. No criticism there, but we don't build the legs to make them long lasting commitments. And I think as we're yep. thinking about impact volunteering, that's one of the things that we're really focused on, which is um, we think of we think of our volunteering um, as part of a like a horizontal continuum. We try to have 
partners in our really imp most important spaces, the things we mostly concentrate on, to have the deepest engagement and the deepest pro bono services. Because of course we pick those things because they 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 matter us. We are making sure that that diversity is both within that construct, but also within the partners, right? And adopting a DEI lens. So just from a corporate perspective, I think it's really important that you don't just send your AAPI affinity group out to volunteer because it, it was in Queens or wherever. Uh, and you don't just think about it that way, but you start thinking about how it builds in because it will create much lo longer lasting value. And then frankly, from the company's perspective, your reputation on the issue becomes authentic as opposed yeah. to you know, continuing to be holding up the problem. And look, there's more to do. I'm not suggesting that you just volunteer your way out of uh, being a part of a system that's created inequity, but I think it's really important. So um, on that note, I want to just ask you all to do sort of what are three things that companies should think about over the next sort of next year, and then we'll turn it over to Q&A. Um, Rasan, why don't you start? But you have to introduce your daughter, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> right. So my daughter, she's seven years old, first grade, and she couldn't find her Crocs and she's about to go outside. So she was like, where are my Crocs, daddy? <laughs> I was like, literally, take my Crocs, take anything, please. Um, That's community need. It's so. community need. There you go. Uh, three <laughs> things. Number one, I just want to reiterate dialogue. What are your systems for creating dialogue and entry into conversations? We said a lot about employee resource groups that don't want folks to walk away. Okay, don't talk to the black no. folks about it. Like George Floyd, you know, just happened. It's an anniversary, but we can't talk to the black folks about it. No, 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 no. They want to talk about it. Just ask them how they want to enter into the conversation. Yeah. Because um, that's how we turn tragedy into triumphs. Now, not everyone's going to show up the way you expect them to. Just be open to how folks show up so that you can pivot. Second thing, data. Data, data, data. You use data to measure success. You use data to understand your customers. Use the data of understanding where need is and even data about where your, your expertise is within your organization, because that can help you show up in the absolute best way. Demographic data, skills data, where folks are located data, just any da data of what the needs in New York City is. Basic needs were huge in this past year. You know, use that data to pivot because, you know, obviously, the dinosaurs didn't pivot. You saw what happened to them. And then lastly, um, use common sense. So discernment, you know, discern, you know, is what I'm proposing really going to pass the smell test of being valuable? Is it meeting our values and is it valuable in community? There was a big article about goodwill and the amount of trash goodwill gets rid of because folks don't sometimes discern, hey, are these old Crocs? useful Will someone want to put their feet in these crocs afterwards or is this really trash and i need to like really get the pair of shoes that i never use that will be used so if you use discernment as you're volunteering uh then that will help you figure out is the community ready to take what you want and also can you really provide the double value like the worth and your beliefs aligning to make sure you have the greatest impact nova you want to add your three Sure. I thought we were going to jump to Gary. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, we, we have to let him sort of end. We've got to wrap it up. We got to let him talk. Because yeah. I'm going to whether you ask me to or not, right? <laughs> yeah. I, uh, make it look like it. you meant it. I love it. I love it. Um, so really quickly, you know, a lot of the things that we've been thinking about and how to engage our corporate members or all of our members for that point um, has really been about how to ensure that New York City recovers, recovers as quickly as possible, but through the lens of being um, uh, responsible, inclusive, and equitable, right? So the three things that I really, I wanna talk about that corporations should really think about over the next year, sort of as they move forward and looking at the needs of communities and providing opportunities for the employees to participate to combat those needs is one, you know, we talked a lot about this on the call, is really how to leverage their resources to elevate the needs of the communities, right? Um, there's no secret of which communities were hit hardest by COVID and everything else. It's the same communities that have been hit hard by everything else. Um, and, you know, over the last year, it's just been exacerbated. So we know where they are. Um, but, you know, offer your skills, particularly to nonprofit organizations, right? Because these are the stakeholders in the communities that's responding to a lot of this work, right? So offer your skills, leverage your resources. Um, you know, nonprofits particularly carry out a lot of our city's social services and are always in need of technical help, not just funding, 
We talked a little bit about that. Consider your area of expertise, how it can help New York. Volunteer days, uh, host a reporter to talk about community need. Use communications assets to elevate those needs, right? Social media, newsletters, customer and client facing communications like bills, right? Right, elevate, identify these communities and talk about what's going on. Uh, host internal staff training days to talk about that cultural competency and sort of where the needs are, but really leverage your resources to help these communities and think of volunteering in a number of different ways. Two, engage your employees to help focus on the city's recovery, right? So not just resources, but think about it from the lens of recovery. In addition to your company's uh, contributed funds, provide opportunities for your employees to support vital charities, right? That I'm, I'm not gonna be self-serving. There were two on this panel um, <laughs> that you could you know, encourage uh, donations to and volunteering opportunities to, right? To help New Yorkers in need. These two organizations touch millions of New Yorkers, right? Encourage your employees to spend their time, donate to these organizations. This builds engagement and retention, and it also provides an opportunity for employees at your company to give back to New York City and its residents. And lastly, you know, we talk about it, but we don't really talk about what small businesses mean to the functionality of com of communities, right? So when we're talking about being intentional, right? Simply by buying from local businesses will help these communities, right? This is an opportunity to encourage your employees to eat at neighborhood restaurants or dine in and take out. Yeah. Use local eateries throughout the city for catering opportunities, right? Purchase goods and services from local small businesses, especially minority women, immigrant, veterans, uh, L L LGBT are now certified, right? Own businesses throughout the five boroughs, right? They exist in all five boroughs. But giving back to your community through uh, purchasing power and through small businesses is a huge way that you can help communities and, and whole. So I'm going to leave it on those three. <laughs> All right, Gary. Now you don't have the rest of the time. We have Q and A still to do. <laughs> I know, and there's some really good questions there. <laughs> um, that the first thing I would say is um, make it your standard practice to start all conversations by asking, "What do you need?" Not starting with, "Here's what we have to offer." Uh, and if you do that, you may, will probably still end up offering something of what you wanted, but the impact and the whole relationship will be different. I'd also say, you know, I, I think we've all talked about this is remembering that our brands are all tied very deeply now to how we show up in the communities, right? And so in a moment of, of what has been a really hard year um, that we have to think, you know, if this goes out in the newsletter, is this how our brands all want to show up? So I would I would encourage companies to try to think also geographically, think about communities, right? Um, and then within that, um, one of the things the last year has taught all of us, and I think we've used as a bit of an opportunity, and the people on this call all know this, but these issues are complex. And so as we think about strategy, it's easy to go hunger, right? It's easy to go, no, we're about education of third graders. And none of these problems exists in a vacuum. Um, and no person has just one problem that you need to fix. And so as we're all being really strategic, that cultural competency training, that issue education you talk about, an investment there will help us all understand like, my day in the park is important and it should be important, but it should start me wondering, why does a volunteer need to do this, <laughs> right? I should wonder why when I'm serving meals at a soup kitchen that I see the same people every week and companies and nonprofits need to be there to support that learning. I'm going to add my own. And then, Gary, am I doing the questions or are you doing the questions? Obviously, I was not paying attention. In <laughs> there you go. Cynthia is going to jump in and do the right, questions good. for us. <laughs> Sorry to the audience. Um, I was actually thinking similarly um, to something that Melva said, which was to remember that your organization has a lot more resources than checks and bodies. Um, and the one example I'm going to give is um, 
we became aware of because of our own employees of the coffee cart on our corner and what was happening to them during COVID um, because people knew them, right? And it's, it's, it's Edith and Angelo and everyone gets their coffee. <clears throat> and all of a sudden it became apparent like, hey, we all left. What happened? Like their entire market disappeared and it got us involved. We learned a lot more about what happens with street carts and they're not even small businesses in a lot of cases. They're often um, um, immigrants. They were pretty much not getting any of the aid that was out there. And yes, we did make donations. We worked through the street cart project. Uh, we were partnered with Robinhood on it, but actually we actually ran stuff on our signs. We did a ton of press around it. We used our social media channels. Uh, we filmed Edith and Angelo and had them tell their story. We shared with employees where they could give because what we realized pretty early on um, was that it was a really invisible problem, but it was affecting 20,000 uh, carts and, and, and 20,000 families are very often family owned. So it was a lot of people that were getting affected by that. And it was really obvious why they weren't gonna have any business. Um, thank God we're starting to come back a little bit, but that's a great example where it's, it, you know, yes, we gave money, but I think you have to think about it um, from all of your channels. Um, Secondly, that there's a 10 year lag. We know from historically when there's an economic recovery that the people on the poorest ends of our spectrum lag by almost a decade. So as we're all celebrating that we can take our masks off, you know, we have to be really honest about what's gonna happen in our poorest communities, which of course suffered the most. And then lastly, when you're thinking about skills-based giving and particularly pro bono giving, we tend to think of our own employees as being so smart and aren't they so amazing? And sometimes there's an arrogance that they know more or that they're somehow more sophisticated than the charities they're serving. And one of the things I always remind our teams as they're going out there is, yeah, you are smart, but trust me that that organization is going to be unbelievably sophisticated at solving the thing they're solving. And yeah. so while their financial books might be in a shoebox, uh, their technology might not look like yours does, their their smarts and their effort around the thing they're solving is unbelievably sophisticated. Do not underestimate what they're bringing to the table and don't think you, you can just, you're not going to come in and fix them. You're going to come in and really understand what's happening with them and give them better tools to do the thing, but don't underestimate how smart and sophisticated they are. Cause that's, I'm sure you've all dealt with it. And I'm sure it's not unique to my company, but um, that's just one thing Like go humble uh, would be my advice. Yeah. So um, that's great. Is Cynthia going to do questions and then we'll yeah, take it Cynthia, yes. you want to jump on? There sure. you go. Sure. We have um, quite a few questions, so we'll see how many we can get to. And I think some of the earlier ones may have been answered already. Um, but we have one: volunteerism seems to be an elite opportunity. How can we engage all people in meaningful ways that we ensure connects communities in need with talent for a multitude of outcomes? So I love this. Um, I grew up in the church community that always talks about everyone has time, talent, or treasure to give. And don't make assumptions about what folks have to offer. I also did my dissertation on Black philanthropy and trying to understand the difference between the Black community giving and their white counterparts. And we all, and it's in the question, experience the world differently. We have different family and community commitments and connections based off of where we are. And it goes back into, I think, the discussions you have with folks and analyzing the data to figure out what can be useful. And you know, we're in the midst of a campaign right now because we couldn't have a gala. And the question was, well, who do you send the invitation out during this campaign? And it's everybody because everyone who signs up for our newsletter everyone that uh, gives $5, someone who gives like $50,000 and everything in between matters because you know, to the points before, Melva brought up a bunch and so did Joan and Gary, social media, getting folks out there, building culture, building awareness, you know, creating community. When we did the phone-a-thon for my company, folks were just happy to hear a voice on the other end. So there's so many things that folks can do. And I think it goes into understanding again, what is your organization good at and what can you collaborate with community to do well? And if you're willing to listen, time, talent, or treasure, they all can make a difference. Um, I also just want to call out that question came from Carol Wasey, um, who is leading Women Creating Change, a group that's uh, 
doing some killer good work and, and really thinking deeply about these topics. And I'm going to call you out, Carol, as needing to be on one of these panels before the end of the summer. Um, great question. And, and the only thing I would add, you know, very, very quickly is that, and we think about this frequently, is that free time is for many one of the first luxuries they might have in their life. And so uh, one of the things I would say is we, we used to say, oh, look who volunteered the most. They're the best. Yeah. And it was like, no, they have the most free time. And yes, they may also be the best, but that idea of, of, of stopping to talk, of, stop talking about volume and think about quality of service, because the person who's shoehorning in 30 minutes a month might, might be, you know, it, it's a huge priority for that person. One last point on that, because the, uh, the carts and supporting small business, that's not volunteerism, but that's right. a culture shift that has a great community yeah. impact. So our frames, is it paid or is it not paid? Is it for-profit or a non-profit? It literally, does it advance community and make things more equitable yeah. or not should be the frame? Not, you know, what's the tax designation? Is it a 501c3 or not? <laughs> right. Agree. Other okay. questions, Cynthia? Yes, oh, we have one. Our secret sauce has shown that when a company provides that staff person to work with the project team, we all achieve greater success impact. However, few companies are able to do so and persist in wanting volunteer opportunities to be automated and able to be listed in a volunteer portal with those interested to directly contact the nonprofit. How do we encourage firms to better resource their community engagement function to reduce the burden on the nonprofit? Gary, I'm going to let you jump in, but let me just start there by Go. saying, I, I think you need to realize that corporations have a continuum of things they're offering. And so some things are self-service and for some charities, that's where you're going to plug in and it's no problem. You know, your God's love, we deliver. You take volunteers every day for certain hours. It's really simple. You just have to go through the mechanics of that. And other ones we have to concentrate more on because it's more skills. It's more limited. There's, there's complications to it. So I think if you're a nonprofit who can't take automated, then you need to be working with, frankly, larger corporations that have bigger staffs and can work with you around some of the skill based piece. Um, the only thing I would just point out there is that, you know, you're going to have two or three people, even in a big company who are concentrating on this and are trying to do this for 50,000 employees. So you need to be a little bit realistic about how much time they're going to have if they have a really structured program then they might be the best outcome outlet for you. And if not, then you may want to talk to Gary. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm going to have you jump in around how you can use an intermediary to help you. Because I just want to be realistic. Like we would love to say that we could handhold everyone. And frankly, our, our employees want us to handhold them too. They want to have the greatest experience and they want us to like hand them the t-shirt and like push them onto the bus. And we can't do that either. So we're, we're all trying to balance that. So you may want to think about intermediaries if you're not a plug and play. And that's totally fine if you're not a plug and play, but you may need a little help if you can't step it yourself. Yeah, and uh, uh, jo Joan said it very well. I think companies, part of what they, needs to happen strategically is understanding like how much can you own? And then, you know, uh, uh, we're all part of an ecosystem, right? So being able to take a, vol a volunteer and send them to New York Cares or recognizing that your capacity to do the day in the park or to understand the need in a particular community, right? Like that takes work and it takes a lot of resource. So working with groups who are present in the community and dedicating your time there, I think will help you scale those uh, programs. And we all, all volunteers want us all to hand them the t-shirt, whether oh, it's gotcha. Joan or me, or, you know, it, it's a, you know, and, and that's, <laughs> That's a good energy, right? But but we all have to figure out like how how we can also get more done in, in a smart way. Great. I think do we have time for one more? We only have two minutes left, Cynthia. So okay. Um, here's one. Our organization deals with addressing social isolation, which is such a major concern during the pandemic. How do we keep social isolation on the corporate radar screen along with hunger and other more data-driven issues? I just wanna make a quick plug, the, the hybrid method, you know, uh, get ha keep having Zooms, keep creating community. So many networks that are rich in social capital have formed during the pandemic, you keep that going. 
but then also utilize what's digital and try to get that in the real analog world. And if you can have a mix that's right, then you can really take care of it because you're absolutely right. Some folks you know, are scared that the mental health impact of this pandemic is gonna be with us for some time. And getting folks out of social isolation, either because of geography or where they are mentally is, is gonna be a real issue. Okay, total shameless plug, and I swear to God, I didn't plant this question, but uh, Morgan Stanley launched the Alliance for Children's Mental Health in February of 2020, not having any idea what was gonna come. Our innovation awards are out now. There's an RFP. We're actually putting out funding for innovative ideas in children's mental health, specifically around anxiety and depression, which the social isol isol isolation is a huge part of. You guys know, but 70% of kids are reporting either a depressive or anxiety episode due to this massive, massive issues. And it's not like when we come out of COVID, they're gonna be great because there's gonna be huge reemergence issues. So shameless plug, you can definitely take a look at that. Um, I will only say this has not been a major focus of course corporate giving, um, which is one of the reasons we got into it. We are really trying to get other corporations to think about mental health as a part of the other things they fund. So I would welcome other voices on this. Um, the point being that education is affected by mental health, criminal justice is affected by mental health. Um, pretty much you name the topic, physical health is affected by mental health. So we're really out there trying to push this. I will say it's not as bad as it used to be, but there's a long way to go. So I'm happy to connect and help you brainstorm on, on who else is paying attention in the space and how to think about that. And I'm just gonna jump in really quickly and then Gary can close us out. Um, I would say, you know, one way is really if uh, we tap into organizations where this is on their radar, um, because, you know, during COVID, uh, something that we did uh, on sort of my volunteer time. So volunteering is what helped me get through the tough time of isolation last year. So doing my census work, but I needed to give back to the community. Uh, we started this thing in Southeast Queens called Southeast Queens Wellness Ambassadors. And the sole purpose of this was to reach out to Southeast Queens residents, both seniors and, and individuals who were suffering from isolation and other sort of possible mental illness and connect them with people just to check on them regularly. So for instance, the Southeast Queens Wellness Ambassadors for Seniors, we partnered with three, three senior centers uh, who were now closed because that were closed because of COVID. And we had over a thousand volunteers call a group of seniors from 10 to 15 seniors every week for four months just to check on them, right? Find out how they were doing, did they get their groceries, right? And then what we would do is we connected back to the senior center to follow up and provide whatever services they need if they weren't getting their groceries or the New York City meal program wasn't working out or they needed their medication. But we had volunteers just call seniors every week. And those relationships still exist till today. I have volunteers calling me. My senior set, I'm like the program <laughs> What are you doing? Why am I sitting up with your seniors? Um, but then we did the same thing. We, we partnered with a consortium of mental health professionals, social workers and other types of clinicians. And people called the hotline and these clinicians provided mental illness services um, for mental health services, not mental illness, mental health, because we all need mental health uh, services to those who were uh, dealing with this. So it's really tapping into those nonprofits yeah. and those communities that are aware of this and then creating a program around it that I think, um, you know, we, that's much needed over the next couple of years after COVID and what isolation has done to many New Yorkers. And I guess as, as, I, as I'm going to help us sign off, I would say um, isolation, uh, and mental health issues are one of those issues that um, has been amplified over the last year in our awareness. It's one of the ones where I say, don't go back, right? Like the, the, we actually learned a tool that if we visit the senior center, that's great. And it's great if we call and it's great if we stop by your apartment building and drop off a meal, right? And part of the catch of isolation means that we're not looking at it every day. Right, so it, it's something we actively have to remember. Um, speaking of actively remembering, um, I am now remembering that we're three minutes over. Um, with a just, I just have to thank you all so much, Joan, Melva, Rasan. Um, your conversations energize me and my work. I just everybody. I know you're not on camera, but please give virtual applause um, as you're sitting at home. There are a bunch of questions in the Q and A. 
Um, you have my promise that we're going to go through those questions. We're going to share back with everybody who came here today. This has been recorded. We're going to make sure it's available on YouTube. I see viral in our future. I don't know about you. Um, and that I think based on today's conversation, um, I think we have to promise to come back and bring the band back together in the fall and take on our next topic. All righty. Thanks, everybody. Again, have a wonderful day and go, go like, go make some change. Okay.